And the reason it's different, and there's all different kinds of collaboration, but I think collective impact, and the way we define it is a long-term commitment by a group of cross-sector actors to solve a complex problem within a shared vision and a shared, and a shared strategy, which is very different than collaboratives, which don't tend to be as structured. And it's very different than partnerships, which, aren't, which don't tend to be as expansive or inclusive, and very different than networks, which are great for sharing knowledge or, or for, for talking about ideas or developing partnerships out of, but aren't as purposeful and deliberate. And I feel like I should just skip this page, because I think Michelle in her talk, she talked about the five elements of collective impact and asked, you know, Jeff is going to talk later, and I hope I do a good job of this. Michelle, are you here? Wherever she is, thumbs up. Uh, she got it. Uh, but I'll go through them briefly. Common agenda. There is a shared understanding of the problem to be solved. There's a shared vision for change, and everyone agrees to it. Shared measurement. There's a commitment to collecting data, sharing it, and using it not to point fingers and not for accountability. It helps with that, but to learn and improve. And if my colleagues from Strive, I'll talk a little bit about Strive later, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, were here, what they would say about this is the importance of data is that people say you can lie with data, but you can lie an awful lot easier without it. Um, the third is mutually reinforcing activities. And this isn't the idea. I think a lot of people think collective impact, we just get all the players together. And it'll add up to what we need it to add up to. The idea of the, of the activities being mutually reinforcing, yes, differentiate it. It's not everyone doing the same thing. It's everyone doing what they need to do to contribute. Um, but there's also a need for and a willingness to adapt approaches based on gaps and based on needs. And you know, a few years ago, we did work with the, the Packard Foundation on their marine fisheries program. And they fund about 17 NGOs around the world who are focused on getting um, fisheries to do more sustainable practices and when, they, when, they, when they catch fish, which is about 80% of the field. It's a very niche field. And one of the things we did, we were supposed to do an evaluation for them. So we went out to get what their community's theory of change was and their community strategy. And of course, they don't have one because communities of organizations don't typically come together and have a shared strategy. And we thought, no problem, we'll map it for them. And we interviewed all 17 organizations and we put their strategies down, and each one said, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, this is what we do, this is what we do. And it really came down to, and we asked them, what's most important to be done? So they each gave their perspective on how you were going to get fisheries to be more sustainable in their practices. And it came down to three factors, and that's how their strategies mapped out. One was you have to change, you have to inform your consumer so they make better purchasing decisions in restaurants and supermarkets. Two, you have to drive policy change. Because without it, there's not going to be any incentive in certain countries where they're just going to buy whatever fish they want. And three, you have to get companies to put pressure on their supply chain. And then you looked at the organizations doing the work. They all, all of them, all 17 said, policy is the single most important lever for us. Yet only three of them were working on policy. All 17 of them were working on corporate relationships because it was more exciting. It, you know, go and talk to Walmart. I'm going to go and talk to, you know, to, to seafood suppliers. Policy is hard, long-standing work. So they were able to look at that strategy and not just have it be the sum of what they were doing, but then some of the organizations shifted. They shifted what they were doing which is tremendously difficult. And not because it was mission creep, not because someone was telling them or funder was telling them they had to, they were shifting it because as a community, for the first time, they had a view of how all of their work fit together. And it wasn't fitting together the way they wanted it to. So I spend a little more time on this one because I think a lot of times this is the, the hardest and most complicated one for people to get. I often think it's, it's like when you go to a marketplace. Um, if you go to a flea market, you'll find dozens and dozens of t-shirt sellers. But it doesn't do any good if you need to buy food. Um, okay, mental note, don't use that example again. Didn't work. Move on quick before anybody notices. Um, fourth, continuous communication. And I thought Michelle did a very nice job of describing this. It means that there are regular meetings. And those meetings, uh, leadership, the folks who are, who are leaders in their systems and in their organizations attend those executive meetings. That there are working groups that come together on a regular basis of implementers and doers. That there's public will that's being built and knowledge that's going out. That there's a real focus on maintaining that communication over time. And lastly, backbone support. And this turned out to be the one that was most critical and hardest to do in some cases. Where we saw progress was being made was because there was a staffed role that was supporting the effort. In some cases, it was, it was a, a new nonprofit. In some cases, it was an existing nonprofit. In some cases, it was just a person. But it was a person whose job it was to ensure that the effort had strategic coherence, to ensure that data was being brought to bear, to ensure that good facilitation was happening during meetings. And if you'll excuse my, my, uh, my lapsing into, into, into a little bit of profanity, it's 
the group that makes sure shit happens between meetings. And I say that really intentionally because I think to me, like this is the biggest problem we have with collaboration and we've all, I'm sure all of you have been in a collaborative effort where you show up at a meeting and everyone comes together and there's a huge amount of excitement. And we're like, yeah, we're gonna go out and do all this stuff together and people are charged and they're fired up and they leave and not a lot happens. And then you come back and you meet again like a month later and people are still fired up and yeah, we're gonna get stuff happening and you leave and not much happens and eventually it kind of fizzles out. And I think when we put out the article a few years ago, I would say that was kind of characteristic of the sector. There was a lot of collaboration fatigue. There was a lot of effort at co-funding and partnering and collaboration that also hadn't yielded what, it, what they, people had hoped it would yield. And it's a lot of work to do it. And I think people, instead of thinking about how they collaborated and blaming that, instead they blamed collaboration. But what we saw is where this backbone support existed, progress got made, things happened. And once quick wins started building, and once people started implementing, the momentum continued to build, and new folks would come to the table. Um, and it yielded some just remarkable progress. And I'll share quickly that we're seeing now, we're seeing a, a renaissance of collaboration happening in the world right now. And I think it's some combination of these ideas getting out with the economic state of the world, people realizing we've got to do more with less, we've got to work together. I think also in the social sector, it's a very natural way for people to work. People want to collaborate. Nonprofits want to work with each other. It's a, it's, a good, it's a good sector for that. And we're seeing these efforts emerging in the US. We're seeing them emerge all around the world. My colleagues are, are seeing them, studying them, speaking at them. Uh, education, healthcare, homelessness, um, income, income generation, economic development, youth development, community development, you name it. These efforts are starting to really, to really spring up everywhere. And it's really exciting to see because even where it's in some cases yielding immense progress, and even in places where it's a little slower, they're not making progress as quickly, people are starting to work together in new ways and exciting things are coming out of it. And I'll just share two examples and please don't try to read this. I see no one sat in the front tables and even if you had, you wouldn't be able to read it. I'll just talk to it for a minute. But Strive is, is how many people are familiar with Strive? A few, so I'll explain it a little more closely. So Strive is a collective impact called a cradle to career effort in the greater Cincinnati area. Cradle to career because their mission is to ensure that every child in their community, from the time they're born to the time they enter the workforce, receives an aligned comprehensive set of supports, structures, great schools, app resources to enable them to be successful. And it came out of a remarkable woman, Nancy Zimfer, who was the president of the University of Cincinnati at the time, who just got sick to death of students arriving at her doors not ready for college. And said, you know, I could do what my predecessors have done. Say, you know, we're going to put them into developmental education, we're going to turn some away, and we're going to point the finger at the K-12 system and say, hey, you, you know, do a better job. What the heck? Um, she did it. She went out and she got all of her colleagues, K-12 superintendents, she got the business community, she got the funding community, and she brought folks together to talk about this issue and how as a community they were going to solve it. And over the course of the 10 years that Strive developed, um, it now includes 300 organizations, nonprofit providers, institutes of higher education, school districts, multiple school districts, um, policymakers, parent groups, community organizations. They're organized around several networks, one focused on kindergarten readiness, one focused on after school providers, one focused on college access and success. And these groups for six years now have been meeting every month because they're making progress. They have 52 indicators they track on education and progress through the collaborative and they're making progress on 47 of them in ways that are faster than any similar community is making around the country. They've gone through three superintendents. For those of you who know education, a new superintendent comes in, new strategy, out with everything in the past, it's now my vision. Every new superintendent has gone and joined this effort because everyone they work with is there. So the leadership has stayed invested and involved. The funding community, if you look at the grant applications of most of the funders in Cincinnati, in the greater Cincinnati region, if you work in education, you'll see on their application, what are you doing to contribute to the Strive outcomes? And here are the Strive measures. What is your progress against those measures? It's one set that they're all using to apply to nonprofits. Instead of traditionally, probably many of you are in communities where nonprofits you work with, they have 10 funders and they have to do different reports and different measures for each one of them. And the amount of time and resources that takes to do. And all of that work is run by a, a relatively small nonprofit. Strive is a five person operation at this point. They provide the data, they facilitate, they ensure that the strategy continues to move forward. If someone misses a meeting, they go and you know, get the right people to go and yell at them and make sure they come back. Um, it's about a $1.3 million operation that's aligning about $850 million of funding. 
Um, I'll come back for a minute to New York State, because I, I do want to say that they, that they made remarkable progress in New York State and, and talk a little bit about how they worked across those five dimensions. So briefly, their vision that they came up with, and this was a 23-member group, also actually led by two remarkably visionary women, uh, Gladys Carrion, who runs the Office of Children and Family Services for the state of New York, which oversees the state's secure facilities, and Liz Glazier, who, who was with the, their juvenile justice group, but then actually moved into the governor's office as his head of, of, of uh, like state homeland security. Um, brought together courts, NYPD, probation folks at the county and state level, advocacy groups, legal aid, uh, 23 leaders within the system to, to get their act together and to agree to a kind of vision, and after a lot of work, said, across New York State, the juvenile justice system promotes youth success and ensures public safety. And there was the time, and I pause on, on, on showing both of those, because you see underneath, community outcomes and youth outcomes. At the beginning of that process, if you looked at the NYPD, they are gonna tell you it's community safety. If we see a kid who's got a gun, we're gonna arrest them. And the legal aid woman is, well, if you look at a kid who's 14, they're not capable of committing a crime, developmentally. They need certain services. There was no way these two were gonna to come together. And the purpose of the work, and I think that this is another really, really important lesson around collective impact, is that it's not about compromise. Like if we just tried to get them to compromise on something in the middle, no one would have come out the winner from this. Instead, it was worth going through all the debates and arguments and discussion until there was a point where actually the light bulb went off in both of their heads. The light bulb went off on the legal aid and the advocacy community that if a child has committed a violent crime, there needs to be a set of services that are more secure that removes them from the community for a time. And that's a small group, and we have to do everything we can to keep that group as small as possible. And the police came to the, came to the realization that, goodness, if youth get the services that they need, and they're in school, and they're getting support, we won't see them again, and our officers don't, won't deal with them, won't have to deal with them. Because kids are police department's worst nightmare. They see, they see so few of them, they don't know how to handle them. Um, they're not trained for it. When we got them together, uh, it was just, uh, all of a sudden the work skyrocketed. Really quickly they formed four goals that they needed to do across the state. Within about three months after of, of us leaving that effort, the governor's office created a backbone in the governor's office and staffed people to it, put forth a strategic plan, it became state law, upstate facilities started to close, um, the city and the state re reached an accord, finally after years and years of going back and forth around realignment to keep kids closer to home and in their communities. And you know, it's still early but remarkable things are starting to happen in that system. Um, three, th three things uh, I'm gonna, I wanna end, because I know I'm getting close to time and I do wanna leave a little bit of time for questions, but the three kind of conditions we see for collective impact happening, one is that there's urgency for change. Nancy Zimp, there, there's Nancy Zimp for seeing all these kids not ready for college, a federal lawsuit, or kids you know, be dying in custody, terrible outcomes. There's an influential champion. And it doesn't have to be a funder, it can be a nonprofit executive, it can be a community member, but there is someone who comes forward to get people together and has the ability to bring people together. And the third is there is some amount of financial resources. Where we've seen these efforts take off, they have a little bit of funding, not a lot, but a little bit to allow them to get some people who are dedicated to it, where they tend to happen more organically, either they go very slow or it winds up back into collaboration where not a lot is happening between meetings. Mm -hmm.